Hi, Gary Stearman. Welcome to another edition of Prophecy in the News. Today's guests, L.A. Marzulli and Richard Shaw, will be right back. Stay with us. L.A. Marzulli, welcome back to Prophecy in the News. It's Thanks always for a pleasure. Me. And today it is going to be a pleasure. We've got some very interesting things to talk about. With him is the producer director of Watchers 8, Richard Shaw. Hi, Richard. Hey, Gary. I call you Richie. Everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and this guy knows how to shoot uh, good video. Let me tell you what. The production values of Watchers 8 are truly amazing. Thank you. We're going to broach a subject, L.A., that a lot of people have branded unchristian or non-Christian. Mm. What are you guys doing talking about bizarre things like, well, hey, uh, let me just hold up your book, Further Evidence. It's got a UFO on the cover. Uh, on the Trail of the Nephilim has this very oddly shaped skull. And we're talking about these subjects. At, at Watchers 8 begins by talking about quote unquote alien implants. Mm -hmm. Now let's just be honest, a lot of people are saying these are not subjects worthy of Christian discourse. We should just keep these out of the church mm -hmm. because they have nothing to do with the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to speak to that subject. Well, w with that in mind, we should keep out the virgin birth and floating axes and talking donkeys and the Red Sea parting and two gold coins uh, found in, in the mouths of fish and men that walk on water and water that's changed into wine staff that turn into serpents. What we're talking about here is the supernatural that is manifesting on the earth. And when we read the Bible, which I believe every word of it is the, is the word of God, we see the supernatural interfacing in real time with real human beings. And there's nowhere, there's no mandate in anywhere in scripture that somehow negates the manifestation of the supernatural on this planet. It, it's not there. In fact, what it tells us in 2 Thessalonians, very specifically, that the fallen one, Satan, will come with all signs and lying wonders. And this is why we are so interested in the UFO mm -hmm. phenomena, because this yeah. is what's burgeoning. We, we are entering, I believe, the age of the Antichrist. He is, I agree. I think he is not far off in, this, in the scope of things. And uh, Daniel and, and Revelation both speak of his reign and his rule as being of a very supernatural, uh, on a, based on a very supernatural set of conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there is another thing, and we've read this verse I don't know how many times, Matthew 24, 37, but as the days of Noah sure. were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I picked up my Bible. I could have recited this by memory. I wanted to read it out of my very own Bible because to me these are incredibly important words. What were things like in the days of Noah? Well, things were like in the days of Noah. We had the Nephilim. We had the seed war going on between the fallen hosts of heaven, the fallen angels, the Bnei ha, uh, uh, Elohim, coming to earth having and procreating with the women. We're told very specifically. What's interesting, Moses is writing this, you know, a good distance, a thousand, two thousand mm -hmm. years after the flood, he's writing this. And he says, the Nephilim, the unholy progeny, the fallen angels and the women of earth, creating this, this hybrid being known as the Nephilim, were on the earth in those days and also afterward. In other words, and there's a lot of confusion about yeah. this. There's only one incursion, nonsense. There are many incursions, multiple incursions. And in, in fact, when J uh, Joshua came into the promised land, who's there? He had to fight. Let's face it, non-human beings. Mm -hmm. They're called giants in the Bible. In Hebrew, they have many names. Uh, but my point, and here's the point, folks, that I want I want to make as we begin to talk about Watchers 8, because it opens on a note that you might find unbelievable. And, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But I have to say that before the flood, the supernatural descended and touched the natural world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jude talks about this. Sure. Peter talks about it. Uh, good old Apostle Peter mentions this, the fact that the angels left their first estate. There are a lot of people who argue against this, saying, you know, these were the sons of Seth and so forth. And, uh, but for the sake of uh, our, our today's program, what L.A. and I would like to stress is the fact that we are now entering those days once again. 
in the news, the fallen ones are referred to by other names. UFOs, for example, mm -hmm. lights in the sky, lights mm -hmm. at night, people being abducted out of their rooms at night while they're sleeping, things like this. These are not uh, beings from Alpha Centauri or Epsilon Eridani. These are beings from um, the places Paul describes, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. In other words, we're, we are really in the heart of biblical territory here. That's, that's what I want to get across. And I, I would certainly agree with that. What we're seeing is the manifestation of the fallen ones, just like we're told in Scripture will happen in the end of days. It's like the days of Noah. And there is a breeding program that's going on. And you say, well, what evidence do we have of that? We have the evidence. Some of that is shown in, in Watchers 8. Certainly well, with the implants, we, we can, when we go in and, and, we, and we we're in at operating theater and we remove that implant, I would love to talk about that more in depth. And it, let's do that right now. Astounding. Watchers 8, again, the producer director of Watchers 8 uh, is, uh, is Richard Shaw over here. I want to call him Richie <laughs> <laughs> and just be informal. Sure. When you shot the scenes that we see with, with Dr. Lear and, right. and some other people present mm -hmm. and trying to remove a, an implant, let's, let's set the scene and from through your eyes as a videographer, somebody with a camera in his hands where you're sure. most at home, what, what, what were you thinking? Well, I have to uh, go back to Watcher 7 a little bit because in Watcher 7 we, we proved the implant was in this guy's leg. We call him Bill. Um, we, we had test equipment that we used. We did a CAT scan of mm -hmm. it, which was expensive to do. We did five x-rays. And we also detected it using a stud finder, which is a simple method just to see if there's something metal under the skin. And metal being the key word. Right. Ordinarily, you wouldn't have metal under your skin. That's right. So that's why Dr. Lear had it. And then we also used a Gauss meter, which detects magnetism. And then we also used a, a frequency counter to see if it was putting out a frequency. And in all three devices, we got very good signals from it. So we get into the actual surgical procedure. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, we did a pre-op test with a really expensive ultrasound machine, which uses sound waves to look for uh, foreign bodies under the skin. And, and it detected it in less than two minutes. So we were great. We, we set up all of our equipment. We had three cameras on the shoot. We had HD TVs with people viewing what was going on. Uh, we, we did another ultraviolet light test to see if we could find any unusual marks on the skin. And we go in and we put the ultrasound machine back on the same spot where we had done it two weeks earlier and nothing was there. So then we got all, out the, uh, all of the other test equipment. The Gauss meter read zero. The stud finder went off no matter where you placed it on his leg, it just went off. And we're going, what's going on here? And, and the problem with it was that unless we could find it using the ultrasound machine, we couldn't start the surgery because we didn't know exactly where this object had gone. And so then what did you do? At that point, it took about an hour. L.A. just goes, this may seem a little weird, but I'm, I'm going to say a prayer. And he lets out this prayer. And it was basically very simple, just a couple sentences asking that whatever force is, is cloaking, cloaking this device, <laughs> hence the name of our program, uh, that God would break that and do it soon, basically. And, and by the way, you'll see all of this uh, in, in very graphic detail. But, but L.A., what we're talking about here is a, is a spiritual phenomenon. In mm -hmm. other words, an implant, metal, if you will, a, and you pray and suddenly it becomes visible. You're talking about a, a, a spiritual battle here, spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare, in my opinion, 3.0, 4.0. I mean, it really is. It, it's, we're in a room of non-believers, as, as Richard just said, and this little, little quick little prayer. And Father, you know, reveal it to us and do it soon. And this guy, the doctor, Matriciana, has been going over this little three-inch by eight-inch strip of flesh for well over an hour and nothing. And, on, and, and what amazed me is when we show this on, on the, uh, in the program in Watchers 8, when, when the object finally comes in, it looks like it's almost like an after effect in post-production. It, it, it looks it comes, like it dissolves. <laughs> it, it's unbelievable. And it shouldn't do that. It just all, it's like it's been cloaked and then it comes in. And it, it, what, it, what amazed us was they, whoever they are, and we, we know who they are, principalities, archons, forces, and dark forces, yes. evil beings. They knew what we were up to. They, they had monitored us. 
they either affected the machinery that, w that was in there or they affected the implant in some way. They cloaked the device. And what broke through that was a prayer and a power greater, you know, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That power that we all believe in, the Most High God, the God of the Bible, mm -hmm. showed up and, and broke what was going on there. And we got the victory. And that moment, yeah. that moment was not lost on anyone in the room, including Dr. Roger Lear. When I, when, and and he's, he, he passed away several months later. But when I sat down with him on the uh, following Monday, we, the surgery was on a Saturday. Monday, we were in the SEAL lab looking at the implant. And I took him outside, which is the two of us, in the hallway. And I said, Dr. Lear, you are aware of what happened on Saturday. And he looked at me and his eyes got real wide. And he said, L.A., I now believe that there is a supernatural component to the phenomena. And I'm going to tell Whitley Strieber about it. What, what had happened, that prayer and the fact that we broke through and the implant was revealed really impacted him. Well, also for all of the people who don't believe in the supernatural, say, uh, or the spiritual aspect of it, we were using state-of-the-art test equipment. State-of-the-art. So, so this is, now we have the technology to physically measure something as it's happening and visually see it. I had a 300 millimeter lens shooting on the ultrasound mm -hmm. monitor <laughs> And I did that at Roger's request because his eyes were kind of getting bad and the, and the ultrasound machine has a screen on it about this big. So I enlarged it so it went, it went up on our 22 inch HD monitor that we put in the room to help Roger see better. And, th and that's what you see the, the signal from. Yeah, and by the Watchers way, you 8. can watch all this on Watchers 8. Again, I want to come back and just hammer on this one idea. Mm -hmm. Back in the days uh, before the flood, the supernatural descended and met the natural world mm -hmm. with horrible consequences, so horrible that God had to destroy the world. It's happening again. The supernatural is descending, becoming visible. It's meeting the natural world. People today are not prepared for that, L.A., and, and I, I speak now to uh, the brethren, uh, to all of you out there who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who are the saved, who are the ones who... Uh, are the, the bearers of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm speaking to you and telling you that this is, in fact, a Christian subject. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus warns us, uh, men faint from fear from what is coming on the earth. Even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. Um, something is coming. Something is here. And you say, well, you know, where's the evidence? The whole point of going into the lab and, and finding Bill and, having, and, and doing this, this process in Watchers 7 and, of course, mm -hmm. concluding in Watchers 8 is to show that there's a, a real physicality to all this. That someone took him against his will 40 years ago and inserted this implant below, below his knee. And that object was giving off uh, frequencies and it showed up on the Gauss meter. I mean, it, it's a real physical object. And then that object was shut down. What's, what are the implants doing? In my, and, and this and again, is all conjecture. In my well, opinion, give, it, give us the short real version quick. In you my have opinion, the long version on, on the DVD. On, mm -hmm. on my opinion, I believe it, that somehow it's affecting the, the the host genome. We don't know that yet because there's never a before and after, and we've never done DNA sampling. I I talked to Roger about that after the thing, like as you did on the Saturday after the the, the shoot, and I said. Roger, I really think that these devices are somehow externally controlled. And he, he agreed. And I, I think instead of using them uh, as an excuse for a tracking device or something like yeah. that, I don't think that's what it is at yeah. all. I think they're sending signals to the nervous system. For what reason, we don't know what it is, but I think there's something that, that, that these implants are doing that, that affects people's nervous system and it caused great pain in Bill's leg. Well, at, at the, the first great descent of the Nephilim, uh, their purpose was to corrupt the human genome, mm -hmm. so much so that only Noah and his family were saved mm -hmm. out of the whole world. Mm -hmm. So they did succeed in corrupting the human genome. Today, they seem to be trying the same thing again, using maybe a slightly different techniques, uh, techniques in keeping with our current level of technology. They're coming back and doing something different, but, the, but they are trying to destroy the human genome. One thing that's interesting, I talked to Bill, our implantee, last weekend, and he said he feels so much better now physically, and he's lost 20 pounds. Wow. That's interesting. Now, mm -hmm. uh, quickly, the, the gentleman who had the implant 
knows how he received it, right? Absolutely. He told us a story. Some of that is in Watcher mm -hmm. 7. When he was a small boy, five, six years old, uh, they appeared in his room, the, the greys. The ones, the small little beings with the gray skin, about three to four feet high with the big wraparound black eyes. And um, uh, he fought them off the first time. The second time, he wasn't so fortunate. He was literally whisked out of his bed. He remembers his, his pajamas like, like flapping in the breeze. That's how fast they took him up through the ceiling. And I realize that sounds bizarre. But remember, we have angels appearing in Peter's jail cell. How do they get there? So we're dealing with technology right. and a physics that's beyond our realm, which is, of course, the supernatural. Robert Salas. And now, I, I, I'm going to stop you right okay. there because we're running <laughs> short on time. And, and I believe that we have whetted the appetite because the full story is on Watchers 8. Uh, we're going to shift gears here. And uh, L.A. has written another book, of course, called the, On the Trail of the Nephilim. And we're going to, to look at a different aspect of the Nephilim. And this time... Uh, from an archaeological uh, perspective, but you guys are going to be at uh, the uh, Pikes Peak uh, Prophecy Conference. Can't Pikes wait for Peak that. Two, right? Yes, we're excited about it. And Absolutely. you're going to have the latest and the greatest mm -hmm. in in uh, displays. Uh, by the way, we'll be looking at some of those here in just a moment. And uh, uh, and Rich, you're going to be there too. Yes, I've been asked back. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, it's going to be fantastic. And there's something you need to know, by the way, uh, about. Pikes Peak 2. Hello, Gary Stearman. Let's talk for a moment about Pikes Peak 2, the Prophecy Summit at Colorado Springs, July 25th through 27th. New discoveries all around. Bob, it's going to be great. It is. The Marriott Hotel in the shadow of Pikes Peak. You couldn't ask for a better place or better speakers. Better speakers like Dr. Thomas Ice, perhaps the world's leading authority on the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. You don't want to miss that. And Bob, Bill Salas is going to be with us. Showdown in Iran, a brand new discovery, a new prophecy that's been forgotten for 2,000 years. Mm, talk about timely. And what about <laughs> L.A. Marzulli? Never without a surprise of some kind. Back from Peru with the latest on the Nephilim. Last but not least, Stan Deo. Stan Deo. Speaking of new discoveries, Stan Deo is going to be talking about something you've never heard before. The discovery of the Garden of Eden. You're going to want to be there. July 25th through 27th, Colorado Springs, Pikes Peak 2, the Prophecy Summit. Okay, guys, let's follow the trail of the Nephilim, the title of uh, L.A.'s book. Uh, you've got this weird-looking skull uh, on the cover of the book, and right in front of you here, you have some other weird-looking skulls. You recently got back from a trip to Peru mm -hmm. where you saw two things that were phenomenal. Ancient architecture, which is inexplicably complex, Very and so. skulls that don't look like human skulls. Just go for it. Tell us all about well, it. Well, I want to I talk about, this is what we call the baby skull, and you can see this. Um, and this was, we... I took, had a Peruvian dentist look at the skull, and uh, he uh, estimated that this particular um, skull was from a boy, from a male mm -hmm. child, about 18 to 22 months old. What was astounding, remember this of course is a replica, what was astounding to us is when we unraveled the skull, the hair was strawberry blonde, it was blondish red. And that just shouldn't be in, in South America. We don't right. have that type of hair, it was very fine hair. But when we look at the skull, we look, see how large this thing is, and then we, we take it and we A, B it next to this skull, which is from a, a, a female between 18 and 25 years old, according to a dentition. Here's 18 to 22 months old, 18 mm -hmm. to 25 years old, and you can see <laughs> it's almost the same size. So the, the question is, and, and this is what Richard and I are, this is why it's so important for us to get the samples out of Peru. We've got nine samples that are sitting there. We're waiting to get the paperwork in order mm -hmm. to, and do DNA testing. Is this the result of cradle headboarding or is it genetic? Is it something else? Richard and I both believe and lean to that we may be looking at some sort of genetic anomaly. But until the DNA testing comes in, we just it's conjecture at this and, point. And only that's because normally the, the length of time it takes to headboard a skull is around three years. So this child's only possibly 18 months old. 
And the skull structure is different from the ordinary human structure in terms of the way it's linked together, the sutures, mm -hmm. the seams, mm -hmm. where the bones come together and so forth. Mm -hmm. Just the forehead on this is massive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. really, really interesting. Now, again, we're not talking about spooky land here. No. We're talking about actual archaeology, and we're talking about another subject, which is, well, it's another view it's, it's of the in. same subject, sure. which is a genetic variation uh, of humankind. Mm -hmm. And the Bible is very clear about this. <clears throat> the seed of the woman is the origin of the seed of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was necessary to preserve the human race uh, in order for redemption to take place, for Jesus to be born uh, as the redeemer of all humanity. Satan, on the other hand, would like to corrupt all of humanity by creating variations in the human genome, and these would fall under that category, I guess. Look, preliminary DNA testing was done on this. It came through, samples came out of Peru about three years ago through Lloyd Pai, who passed away in 2013. And the preliminary DNA testing, which by the way, caused all sorts of eruptions on, on the internet, it went viral. But the preliminary DNA testing on the microchondral DNA, the, the, the female side of, of, the, of the genome, stated very specifically that they were elements, they were parts of the genome, parts of, or parts of the microchondrial DNA which did not fit in any of the database. It just mm -hmm. was not there. It was unknown. And this is why it's so imperative that we get the DNA testing. What was interesting too is we had uh, a certain uh, group of critics who were saying that the, well, the results were contaminated. How would they know that unless they talk of a geneticist? None of these people did that. So they're basically creating a canard just to disprove this. The, the problem is is this, Gary, when we look in the Bible and we see in Numbers 13, we know that the Nephilim were there. We have it in Moses' own words, the Nephilim were on the earth and also afterward yes. when the fallen angels went into the daughters of men. And there's a seed war that's been going on literally for, for millennia and it's continuing now in modernity. This is what, this, is, this skull is about 2,000 years old based on carbon-14 sure. dating. And yet, Bill's implant is, was very recent, obviously, 2014, just a few months ago, we took it out. The same, we believe, the same type of phenomenon, the same type of manipulation of a genome is going on now. And this ties into biblical prophecy. Well, let's shift gears and talk about another aspect of your trip, and that's the, the, uh, the architecture. You saw huge, basically uh, unrepeatable, that is, if you tried to make something like that today, you'd be hard-pressed to do it. Architecture, and, and also I understand you visited the Nazca plain where the, these mysterious lines are laid out. Give us a, a quick minute or two view of that. Well, Nazca was incredible uh, for both of us. It, it's it's huge, huge area. I mean, it goes on for literally uh, scores of miles, and it's this large flat plain, and there's like a volcanic um, deposit when you scratch the surface, it reveals this white earth underneath it. And what's amazing is these lines go on, some of these lines go literally for miles, for, for scores of miles in the desert. And straight as a laser. Yeah, straight as a laser. And then we get, we get these pictographs. We have the monkey, we have the whale, mm -hmm. the spider, the hummingbird, all these many people have seen. But when it's one thing to see them in pictures, another thing, boots on the ground when you're actually there and you're in Nazca, and, you're, and we're flying over this stuff, and Richard and I are just, look at that, we couldn't even believe what we were seeing. Uh, it's, it's just mind-blowing, it's astounding. And it, it begs the question, why does a culture get up on a Monday morning and feel the need to do this? And you remember, originally, you could only see these and really appreciate them from the air. And in 1928, they were discovered as a pilot happened to look down as he was flying over the Nazca line. You go, oh my gosh, look at that, there's a, there's a spider there. And so this is, it, they're very enigmatic, very mysterious, um, multiple civilizations built and, and etched things in, in the Nazca Plateau. Um, Brian Forrester, our, our friend and colleague, believes that the Paracas culture, where, where all these skulls are from, were perhaps the originators of, of the Nazca lines. Again, that's not known, but it's, it's just an incredible area. Well, it's all right here on Watchers 8. And by the way, Watchers 8 is yours for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. You will be amazed. 89 minutes uh, of uh, well-produced 
uh, video. And by the way, <clears throat> as we always do, <laughs> we put together a package because a lot of you haven't had the opportunity <clears throat> to see all uh, of the work uh, of L.A. And, and Richard Shaw. So uh, we're making a package offer for, the, for you today in, in case you want to extend uh, your reading. We have here further evidence of close encounters on the trail of the Nephilim, which is just loaded with uh, not only text but great pictures. And for $69.95, you can have the DVD, the two books, and two bonus DVDs from Orlando uh, when L.A. spoke on the worldwide UFO explosion and Peru Take Two. All those items yours for $69.95 when you ask for the Watchers 8 package. That would be about a $115 value, and you'll just absolutely be amazed at what these two men have discovered. Where would you like to go from here? We've got a couple of minutes to sort of round everything out to a conclusion. What would you like the average Christian to know after all of the digging and researching you've done? Rick? <laughs> I, and I know that's a huge question. Well, it is, because I, I guess what we tried to do in Watchers 8 is tie the two phenomena together mm -hmm. from the past experiences there in Peru to what's going on now today and show that there's linkage between the two, which was really difficult to do. Watchers mm -hmm. 8 was probably the toughest film that I put together of the entire series because of that. Because the problem is a lot of people just don't believe this stuff is real. And here we have hardcore physical evidence to show people that, you know, here you go. Explain to me then what this is. What is this implant that we took out that we analyzed in the lab and, and used an electron microscope on. So we're, u we're doing as much scientific research as we can to prove that we're just not making this stuff up. There's a battle on planet Earth. It's been mm. going on for a long That's time. Right. It's between really the good guys and the bad guys. Mm -hmm. There are good angels. We've read about them, Michael and Gabriel and others. But there are bad, there are evil angels out there working, and they have been since before the flood. They're still working today, according to the Apostle Paul sure. and others. The fight is on, and it's really a fight for humanity. Who's going to control humanity? And I think that's where, what you're in the middle of, right? Absolutely. We're on the front lines, the cutting edge of this stuff. Um, uh, I was up at a, a prophecy conference just recently with you, and before I uh, was there, we were... Um, w with Chief Joseph Riverwind, and we were just sitting and having a nice little chat by a, by a lake, and a demoniac, who, remember, I'm thousands of miles, no one knows I'm there, I'm in an undisclosed location, and a demoniac yells from 50 feet away, L.A., we know who you are. Wow. And we prayed against that, and, uh, you know, we, we, di we did the thing. The bottom line is, we are at war, and this war is beginning to spill over into this dimension. The fight is on. L.A. Marzulli, Richard Shaw, thanks for being with us today. I'm Gary Stearman, and by the way, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported program made possible by our many friends around the world. Be sure you tune in every day for breaking news and our daily prophetic news updates at prophecyinthenews.com or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prophecyinthenews.